All right, looks like people are filtering in. We'll get started. Hello and happy Friday, everyone. I'm Jurgen Pilot with the National Offshore Wind Research and Development Consortium, and I'd like to welcome you to our first webinar of the year entitled Opportunities in Offshore Wind Grid Integration. We're excited to bring you a thorough presentation assembled by our partners Hitachi ABB Power Grids and the Electrical Power Research Institute. Before I run through our panelists, I'll mention that this webinar will be recorded and we intend to send a recording link out in the next few days. I should also mention that we encourage the audience to participate using the Zoom Q&A functionality. We've enabled viewers to upvote comments of interest so that we can prioritize our response at the end of the webinar. Uh, if you have questions that are directed at a particular panelist, please name that panelist in the question so that we can direct it appropriately when we get there. And with that, I'll move into a brief run through of our panelists. As I mentioned, I'm Jurgen Pilot, Program Manager with the National Offshore Wind Research and Development Consortium. I'll be doing a quick introduction this morning on the consortium, as well as moderating our Q&A session at 11 a.m. Eastern time. Joining me this morning is Fabio Fracaroli, Senior Director for the Renewable Segment in North America for Hitachi ABB Power Grids. He'll be joined by his colleague, Gary Ratcliffe, who serves as Vice President of Market and Innovation for North America. From EPRI, we'll be joined by Principal Project Manager, Brandon Fitchett, and his colleague, Senior Project Engineer, Jonathan Ruddy. For those who are not familiar, the National Offshore Wind Research and Development Consortium is a nationally focused, not-for-profit organization responsible for facilitating prioritized offshore wind research and development to reduce the costs associated with offshore wind, as well as addressing other technical barriers to development. As a consortium, we maintain a membership of 25 private and public offshore wind leaders, including both EPRI and Hitachi ABB power grids. We rely on this membership to help us identify and prioritize technical research areas as well as to maximize our industry engagement efforts. We operate on funding provided by the Department of Energy, the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, and the contributions of our members. Uh, I've linked to our website on this slide where you can find more about what we do and the type of projects that we fund. So this slide and the next highlight our awards to date. We have issued and closed two competitive solicitations since 2019. And from over 170 unique submissions, we've currently made 25 project awards that are in varying stages of contracting or execution. Uh, we'll be showcasing our project progress at our annual public technical symposium to be held this November 8th, 9th, and 10th. So save the date for that. We also hope to announce our final award selections from our most recent solicitation in the coming weeks. Uh, we do intend to release an additional R&D solicitation in 2021. So if you're interested in participating, please subscribe to our mailing list on the National Offshore Wind website. And on my final slide, I highlight the geographic diversity of our various project awardees and sub-awardees. As you can see, uh, we are living up to our mission of national engagement. Uh, we strongly believe in a diverse, collaborative US offshore wind industry, and we're beyond excited to see our award portfolio reflect that mission. And now onto the topic at hand, offshore wind grid integration. Our expert panelists have put together a packed agenda for today's discussion, and so without further ado, we will start with a recap of U.S. market for offshore wind and the grid's evolution, presented by Fabio Fracaroli of Hitachi ABB Power Grids. Fabio, over to you. Thank you very much, Jürgen, and uh, once again, uh, happy Friday. Good morning, everyone. Thank, thanks for your time uh, on, on a busy Friday, and uh, hopefully you will enjoy uh, the conversation. Uh, and you you have some takeaways uh, on on a, on this Friday. I will start uh, just showing a little bit uh, what is happening in in some highlights of the offshore wind segment in U.S. And uh, as you can see on the graphic, that's that's a, a Wood McKenzie prediction about uh, the installations that uh, are yet to happen in U.S. And you can see onshore and offshore as well, the cumulative power forecasted to be installed in the upcoming years. And uh, um, I would like to highlight a few things. Uh, I would start saying that the fundamentals so for, for US offshore wind are in place. And what I mean with that, if you look offshore wind in US, it has the, the right natural resources. It, it has a in particular, the Northeast has a very strong and constant wind 
Uh, it is on shallow waters, meaning we still can use fixed foundations, which is a technology readily available. Uh, it is very close to the consumers of energy. So the Northeast is one, if not the most crowded region in US. Uh, and also other things that I call fundamentals are in the right, right place. Uh, for example, the costs of offshore wind compared to other generation methods are decreasing substantially and now getting to a point where it is really competitive to other uh, uh, generation possibilities. Uh, I mentioned about the location, so it, it is in, in the right spot, close to consumers. And I would say for the last few years, it's getting more and more public and corporative support. So public in a sense that people are understanding and supporting better this industry uh, the whole not in my backyard concept, which is still present, we 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 see that it's it's moving away. People are understanding better uh, the benefits of offshore wind. In the corporative support, we see more and more corporations going towards a, a green energy, towards making sure the energy they consume it's coming from from a renewable source. And lately, uh, also another important piece, the government support. So we see an extremely strong state commitment. We have seen lately as well uh, a, a reinforced federal commitment, which certainly uh, it's another fundamental that it's, it's coming now all together to put this uh, uh, industry in the right place. We... As you can see in the forecast, we estimate that uh, by 2035, we'll have uh, around 30 gigawatts of installed power. And there are different forecasts, some more pessimistic, some more optimistic. I, I honestly believe uh, we will get there even before 35. And, and some of the newest developments are supporting that, for example, the creation of an investment tax credit specifically for the offshore wind industry was very welcomed. We know from the industry perspective how important ITCs are. We see that in, in uh, uh, onshore wind and solar most recently. So we truly believe that's going to help to support the business case. Um, another point to comment, U.S. has become a very attractive mar market for many European players. For oil and gas majors, we have seen lately many, many uh, traditional oil and gas companies investing now in, in, in renewables, but most noticeable on offshore wind. Uh, we see, as I mentioned before, the government and public support. And I think one of the last pieces to mention is the economy recovery, which is very, very important in the moment we are living in. We see offshore wind bringing a lot of benefits, not only the development itself with the wind farm, but all the surroundings, all, all the, the coastal cities, the ports that need to be rebuilt or built from scratch. And even going further, even we've seen in Europe that offshore wind can also attract tourism to the area. So it's, it's really a, a, a very strong industry on in that regard. So we face some, some uh, initial hurdles, especially in terms of federal permits, which are now uh, being overcome. Uh, and we do believe that now with the pace uh, of uh, growth on this industry will really, will really be much stronger than ever, which will, I guess, put some uh, US grid operators under stress and will challenge the grid, which is, I guess, the, the topic today. And then just, Moving forward on that, uh, backing up a little bit on, on the grid. So we, we had a grid that was traditionally uh, a grid uh, based on a, a very large power generation source like a nuclear power plant or a coal power plant. It's a very, I would say, uh, a traditional generation method that then was connected uh, uh, downwards to, to where the consumers were. And we are seeing the grid changing a lot lately. We see renewables as, as I would say, demanding a more flexibility from the grid. And we'll talk in details about that 
we see in the near future the introduction of uh, uh, electrical vehicles posing another challenge to the grid. So we'll see bidirectional flows and a lot of different things. That's what we are trying to illustrate with the today graphic you see on the, the left. But also we see in the future when uh, AI will play a role so that the grids will become even more complex. We'll be able to forecast weather in a better way. We can predict, consume, we can uh, handle storage better, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of what we see will have an impact on the grid. And, and that's why we, we are here today to talk about that. Uh, I will just highlight a few things here. I think uh, back to offshore wind and, and why it plays a major role, role on the energy transition. Besides being a huge industry, I think uh, it is also uh, an industry that has proven that can compete with forward order generation methods. It has a very high uh, capacity factor because the wind is strong and constant and also is close to the load center, as I mentioned before. Uh, it is complementary to other methods like solar. Uh, and also in the near future, we'll see uh, offshore wind coupled with green hydrogen, which is also another stored method uh, and storage is one of the things that it's quite important talking about the renewable generation. Uh, of course, the players in the offshore wind industry, they face some challenges and I listed the, just a few right there. If I had to stress some of them, I guess I would say digitaliz digitalization and cybersecurity is most probably a, a big one. So if you think about the scale of those farms, the importance of those farms for that particular grid, I think cybersecurity definitely is increasing in terms of importance. As well, I, I guess bankability. So those are very large projects, very long lead time. So companies, developers, suppliers, they need to be uh, sure they can, I would say, uh, uh, develop the project in this very long time frame and, and bankability plays a role. And then to wrap up uh, grid development and integration, which is the topic today, that's a major one. So the grid has to change. It is most probably the Northeast is most probably the oldest grid in North America. It's an extremely congested area uh, and, and all those changes in the power generation profile is certainly uh, posing some, I would say, challenges uh, to the grid. Uh, but also, I guess that's good news because there are a lot of good answers for, for those challenges. Here, just a glimpse from the technology standpoint, and my colleagues will, will go deeper on details there. Some of the things we see on the offshore industry, we see turbines getting larger, voltage going higher. Uh, we see DC playing a major role. So, and, and we'll talk about that in a second. And then in, in a little bit, uh, 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 the more distant future, but not so distant, we'll see floating offshore playing a role, which is not yet the case in the Northeast. But if you think in places like the West Coast, that's why where we see and, and why we see floating as a, as a major uh, important technology. Uh, and I guess that was a quick uh, overview on my side in terms of, of uh, the, the overall segment. And uh, I will hand over now to my colleague, Brandon from APRI. And, and then uh, please go ahead and put your questions as we move along. We'll make sure we we'll answer in the end. Thank you. Up to you, Brandon. Thank you, Jurgen, And thank you, uh, Fabio. Thanks everybody for joining today. Again, my name is Brandon Fitchett. I'm here from the Electric Power Research Institute, or EPRI as we call it. And I'll talk to you quickly about some offshore generation technologies, and we'll get into some of the grid integration topics of today. Electric Power Research Institute uh, works across all forms of power generation, all areas of the power grid, grid planning, grid operations, and we're funded by over 400 members across the globe, uh, more than 
of our funding comes directly from these members who choose which areas that they want to contribute to R&D. <clears throat> Today, we're covering a couple of those areas in, in grid operations and planning, uh, as well as wind energy and an offshore wind. We've done some road mapping uh, over the last couple of years with folks across the, the gamut of, um, of wind energy, as well as the grid integration aspects of wind energy and identified numerous areas where there are R&D gaps specifically around the, the wind power plants themselves and, and how they need to interact with the power grid of the future. Um, as Fabio is mentioning, there are a lot of congested grids and areas that will start to see increased amounts of renewables fed into them. And the renewables plants themselves uh, need to be designed a bit differently than they have been in the past in order to more flexibly fit into that power system of the future. So we'll get into how that uh, impacts a little bit about offshore wind today, as well as some of the um, more traditional ideas around uh, reduced costs in, in both capital and operational sense and what that's doing to the industry. Now, fairly obviously, um, the deployments are projected to increase, mostly because in this case, costs are decreasing and, and they're decreasing fairly rapidly, especially around offshore wind uh, and, and this upfront capital cost is extremely important. So these uh, upfront capital costs are, are dropping still in the neighborhood of 10% a year and, and projecting that outwards, we still, we still foresee a five to 10% per year uh, cost decrease and, and we do this this modeling, uh, we do this modeling through databases of actual plant developments and still see this happening. So, you know, out towards the mid 2020s, still on this ramp down of five to 10% per year cost decreasing. And that's where uh, the North America uh, percentage of global offshore wind annual build starts to pick up. So I've highlighted that in this projection on the right, which incorporates uh, numerous industry projections and including ours. Uh, at EPRI and showing, you know, the North America is a minority of the global output, but uh, the global outlay of offshore wind, even through the 2020s. Um, but that's, that's a, in the neighborhood of half or more some years of the total wind energy build in North America. So this is, you know, some years are in the neighborhood of about five gigawatts a year projected out in, in the mid 2020s out through 2030. A lot of this driven by the, the economics and where are these economics um, starting to make sense the most? Fabio uh, mentioned this as well. They're making sense where there is wind resource, uh, shallow water, um, and that's shown in that first chart on the left together where there is you know, near, near world-class wind resource available in the, the northern northeast, especially off the coast there of uh, Connecticut, Massachusetts, uh, Long Island. And that's combined with fairly shallow water, but it's it's shallow enough that it extends far enough from shore that these offshore wind farms can be put in an area that um, also something Fabio mentioned where um, you know the the public perception is is not highly negative in some of these areas, they will barely be visible from shore on most days. Uh, so the the shallow water extends far enough out into these wind resource areas that um, you know, public perception should be less of an issue when they're farther from shore. And uh, in, in a quantitative sense, a lot of these areas have electricity prices and cities because the, there are cities and population centers nearly on the shore um, near this wind resource offshore. So you can see the, in, the, in that third uh, map, that the, the population density along the coast is, is more than a thousand people per square mile. Those are really all the cities along the coast in the Northeast and in out Long Island. So that's why these plants in that last plot on the right, that's why these plants are going where they're going. That's why these things are being proposed where they are being proposed first um, due to the, the world-class wind resource, shallow water depth extending far from shore, electricity prices fairly high on the coast and uh, in that load proximity right there on the coast that can be fed from offshore wind. 
So as economics change and, and, um, and prices for offshore wind come down, then there's opportunity for offshore wind to spread beyond here, beyond the Northeast. And as floating offshore wind uh, costs come down, there is, there's opportunity there for that to spread where you have three out of four of, of these things that are listed across the bottom of the, the screen. Uh, now, one of the first things here, you know, you have this wind resource, but when is it? So starting to get into the grid integration aspects of offshore wind, um, the challenge is getting energy when you need it. Now, fortunately, this is actually a look uh, in the Northeast here, um, looking at, uh, from a study put together by NIPA um, and Brattle, looking at the, the New York ISO generation in a summer day where the wind is not extremely, you know, not very high, but you do have solar. And it looks like the offshore wind resource in a long-term average sense actually matches fairly well with solar during the middle of the day where the wind is a little bit lower midday, um, the sun picks up that, that low and the, on, the offshore wind picks up a little more at night and, and into the evening. So there are, are a few gaps here where, um, you know, either flexible generation, flexible load, or things like storage could be integrated to try to match near exactly this uh, average load need over time. And this is just looking at wind and solar combined, uh, nothing else. So, you know, there is still the need for some flexibility in, in these assets and in other assets. So that is a, a pretty strong point here that, um, you know, there, there is flexibility to be had in these renewable plants the, the exact right answer and the exact way to get that flexibility is not yet known. And that's a point of research here. And that's the challenge is, is to get energy when you need it from these resources. Uh, and that can be had again through flexibility in the plant. And then one way to get flexibility out of the plant is curtailment. Uh, that's not always a nice word, but again, um, you know, in the economics of these plants, it's something that's going to have to be uh, considered um, in the, in the, the compensation scheme around these plants. There's flexibility to be had. Uh, there's some value to that flexibility um, and, and it should be compensated for in that you know, power grid of the future. Uh, it's doubtful that these plants are just gonna continue to be um, incentivized for raw production for as much production as possible whenever they're able to produce. Uh, it's gonna be a lot more valuable to get energy out of these plants when needed. And that's gonna to start to be uh, built into the, the design of the plants and the, the finances and the, the pro forma models of these plants. Uh, of course, these, these machines are getting much larger, um, you know, more than 10 megawatts, more than 200 meter main rotor sizes we're talking about. Um, the, but the, power production regime is not has not changed much really in the last 40 years. Um, power production is typically somewhere in the range of three or four to 25 meters per second. I've seen that recently start to get expanded in some of the newest wind turbine models out to 30 meters per second with some reduction in power output to reduce the mechanical loads. Uh, the temperature ranges are, are really have been unchanged over the last again 30, 40 years. Uh, usually that range is somewhere in the neighborhood of minus 20 or minus 30 Celsius up to sometimes 35 or up to 40 Celsius uh, for hot, hot weather wind turbines. Um, just pointing out this, the, the potential operation up to 30 meters per second, that's a, a halfway decent tropical storm where you could still be operating and producing power through it. And that may be needed, uh, especially in the Northeast. Um, even in the winter where, you know, nor'easter storms come through, you can definitely get these kind of 50, 60 mile an hour winds offshore um, and being able to produce power and, and support the grid on those cold days onshore is extremely valuable. So the challenge here, the integration challenge is operating at the extremes. It's not, again, it's, it's an unknown a bit and it needs to be researched. So some of these are R&D challenges. Do we need to operate beyond 25 or beyond 30 meters per second? Do we need to operate below minus 30 Celsius or you know, above 40? I doubt it's, it's on the higher end of that, um, especially offshore, but uh, maybe the lower end. Uh, 
So these extremes need to be looked at in terms of grid integration and when will the grid again need the, the energy from these assets. So we're gonna look at a, a couple plant setups. And again, we, we just kind of zoomed in on the wind turbine for a second. Um, that's really in this OEM scope circled here. Uh, with which fits in the developer box. You know, the, the developer typically selects an OEM, lays out the plant, uh, is responsible for the, the array or the collection system. And here in the US, uh, a lot of times, and this, this kind of follows the same model as onshore wind, a lot of times the developer, it looks like is starting to be responsible for the run to shore, the transmission to shore, and, and all the way into the nearest point of interconnect to the utility or off taker. Now, in, in Europe, um, the models have been a little bit different. The off-taker, the utility, and sometimes this is government-supported, sometimes um, incentivized, that the off-taker or onshore utility is sometimes building the transmission out uh, to the plant. That probably gives them a lot more flexibility over what they're getting, um, what type of interconnection they're getting, and, and the you know, control over substations and uh, the control station, for example. So these are, are pretty different, um, both financially as well as the amount of control that the utility and off-taker may have over that power plant. The, the developer scope in Europe is looking a little bit smaller compared to the off-taker or utility. Um, this is a whole system, which, which I just showed. Uh, the, the developer scope is almost always including these electrical balance of plant options. Fabio mentioned at the beginning, you know, this has moved, and this is pretty recently, has moved to a 66 kV, uh, you know, almost standard for electrical balance of plant options. That has happened because the turbines have doubled in size very quickly um, compared to on, their onshore counterparts. They're going to be soon, you know, near triple in size compared to their onshore counterparts. Does that mean that some of these um, systems should change again? Should they step up by another third as the turbines increase in size and increase in distance to one another by another third. So these are questions that we need to look at. Uh, that's just in the electrical balance of plant. The challenge here is really system optimization across turbines, transmission, this electrical balance of plant, and system integration. So that's why I'm uh, here today with uh, Jonathan Rohde, who has worked in grid operations and planning and uh, transmission options for offshore wind. These need to fit together. Um, here we're breaking down barriers. I think there are definitely some walls in the industry around, you know, the between the the OEM, the developer, the off takers of offshore wind, and that makes it a little bit more difficult to optimize this as a system. So the power plants themselves um, need to be able to fit into this grid of the future, right? But the the grid of the future also. Uh, may be able to adjust to the new types of resources coming onto it. So there, there are optimization issues at every, every step of the way here. Should these electrical balance of plant options start to step up in voltage, does that impact the transmission to shore? Does that make things like high voltage uh, DC more viable with a higher voltage electrical collection system offshore? A lot of these questions are not fully answered, I would say. Um, but we're gonna look at some of those options today as these electrical balance of plant options obviously feed into a transmission system. <clears throat> and that transmission system feeds into, you know, uh, the power grid onshore and, and into factories and, and folks' homes. So I'm gonna hand off to Jonathan to start to discuss how that occurs here and what are some of the technological options around it. Thanks, Jonathan, welcome. Thanks, Brandon. Uh, hi, everyone. And thanks to Jurgen for having me here. Um, as you can tell from the accent, I'm uh, based in Ireland in, in Dublin, and I work for EPRI based here at every European headquarters, um, working on grid operations and planning and transmission options for offshore wind. Um, so I'm just going to give a little context uh, initially about you know the, the two main uh, connection options for offshore wind, uh, AC connections and DC connections. So if we take the AC connection first, it's a direct connection to shore by uh, 60 hertz AC cable. Um, you may have some uh, offshore station or offshore platforms in the middle with reactive compensation um, to to extend that distance out. Um, you do have things to to consider onshore with reactive compensation because 
because of AC cables. Um, from a, the DC side, uh, DC interconnection, that's for, for further offshore, um, offshore wind farms, typically. Um, there's an offshore converter station where the, the, uh, the, the voltage is, is changed, it's changed from an a AC to DC system um, on the offshore platform. Uh, DC cable to shore and uh, another uh, DC to AC converter station onshore. So a little bit more, um, a little bit more uh, going on in that system, but it's also a very well understood one. And both of these have been have been uh, used uh, in Europe and across the world for integrating offshore wind. Um, so next slide. There we go. So to dive a little deeper into an AC connection, so. It's, as I said, it's well understood um, at the moment, and it's probably the, the first um, the first uh, way that a lot of this offshore wind will be connected. Um, for some of the closer to shore offshore wind, around about less than, than 60 miles, although that's very site specific um, and, and project specific where that crossover point is uh, between AC and DC. Uh, you, th there is there's been a lot of development in, in AC uh, over the past maybe 20 years to to extend that distance out, and the, the basically the economics drives the decision whether you go for for AC or DC at, at this point, especially if it's a, a single point to point um, offshore wind farm connection. There are still a number of things that we need to understand about this, uh, particularly in the offshore network, um, to make sure that we maintain the stability of the system, to make sure that we understand the implications of uh, having really long AC cables connected into our onshore network what impact that has for transmission operators who are are used to the system performing a certain way and now uh, things have to perform a little differently because you've got a, a gigawatt or two gigawatts of AC connected offshore wind creating different flows, different um, and different voltage system, different voltage issues for the for the system. These are all issues that can be solved, but it, it needs to be understood and planned for uh, in a coordinated way. Where the, the system becomes more challenging is if you have multiple AC connected plants coming into the same point of connection or, or nearby point of connections onshore, then you need to consider how those interact with each other and how the control um, or how the, the voltage control in particular can be coordinated across the parallel plants. A um, number of things there that, that need to be, to be looked at from, from the system planning point of view. Standardization has really helped to, to build this out um, and, and to, to improve this uh, AC connected wind farms can be uh, you know, put in in, in chunks uh, at, at standard voltage levels and standard power levels. Um, and that's really helped to drive the cost down as well and help that sort of modular build out. So on the DC side, um, apologies. So I'd say the point-to-point -point DC connections are well understood. So in uh, particularly in Germany, in Europe at the moment, there's a, a lot of point-to-point -point AC offshore wind farms with maybe one to two, or DC offshore wind farms with maybe one to two offshore wind plants connected to the same uh, HVDC transmission to shore. Um, these they may they may be connected together on the on the offshore wind side. So you may have two to three plants connected to the same uh, DC DC transmission system. Um, there are some advantages of that. You can obviously go much further offshore with the, the wind plant. Um, the onshore converter station gives you a lot of controllability and, uh, and independent control of active and reactive power, which is a huge asset to the, to the, uh, the onshore um, grid operator. But the, the other side of that is that our offshore system is now completely decoupled from the onshore system by the, the, DC, uh, the DC cable. Um, and that means that the AC system offshore has no synchronous machines. It has no no conventional uh, conventional way of operating the power system. So it's a fully electronic grid, and that comes with a different set of of of, uh, of design criteria and challenges and, and things like having uh, grid forming offshore, where the 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 actual DSC HVDC converter station needs to control that offshore grid and make sure it's space stable. Um, Again, when you go to, to parallel uh, versions of, of these uh, HVDC links, that increases the complexity and increases the uh, increases the, the design challenge there. Um, 
it, it's very important, I think, when when designing and specifying the, these uh, DC links for offshore wind farms that you consider the impact of the next one in and the next one after that and how how we can build those up to scale uh, to have multiple parallel paths to have um, DC connections connected together to make sure that they they are interoperable if we're using different vendors for the for the DC substations in particular um, and for the offshore wind plants and um, making sure that that the in the design criteria all of those things are are taken care of is a big challenge for the industry at the moment and it's where a lot of work is is going in uh, at in Europe at the moment. So I want to touch briefly on how we get to sort of meshed offshore grids. Um, there's been a few studies, I'm sure you have seen some um, with uh, looking at a backbone grid in the, on the East Coast or uh, certain variations of a DC meshed offshore grid. Um, I, I think how we're actually going to get there is going to be a little bit more uh, step by step and a little bit more modular than than coming out and maybe we'll come out and build a, an initial um, you know, offshore super grid, but um, I think step-by-step -step approach is probably the way it's going to go. So at the moment we have, we have good experience with parallel AC connections. Uh, even those AC connections are connected together at the same offshore substation. So you have a small modular offshore grid with four to five to six offshore wind plants connected to maybe three offshore cab cables to shore. Um, and that, that's a, a form of an offshore grid. You've got a parallel DC connections, as I mentioned, maybe two to three DC connections with four to five or six uh, offshore wind plants all connected together. That way you have a more reliable system um, compared to just having one wind farm, one cable to shore. You have parallel paths and different paths for the power to flow if you lose a cable, um, which, which can happen. Um, so, uh, that's that's what we understand at the moment. I think the next steps to that could be things like hybrid interconnectors, where we have from one market area we have a, a connection out to shore to a, a cluster of offshore wind plants and another connection back to shore to another market area, uh, and that look, that path could not only just be used for exporting offshore wind power, it could be also used as a uh, path to uh, transfer power between the two market areas. Um, so kind of getting double the use out of the out of the um, out of the cable, and there's been there's an example of that called Krieger's Flak in in Europe at the moment. That's that's been developed between Denmark and Germany to uh, they utilise the spare space on the cable as a transmission um, uh, between between the two countries. Um, existing AC, uh, if you, so if you start out building an AC wind plant uh, connected, and the next uh, iteration as a DC connected, paralleling those together and, and maybe connecting those wind plants would be a way to step up that offshore or wind network and uh, and drive that uh, that offshore mesh network. Um, I think the the final thing then that you hear about is multi-terminal mesh HVDC, and that's sort of the the final step after that. Again, as I mentioned, interoperability, building out modular um, systems that that can be added to. Um, and designed, you know, 10 years after the, the initial system goes in, it's going to be very important to design and specify when, when, uh, when the utilities are, are putting together their initial uh, plans for offshore wind transmission. So I wanted to, to mention this, um, this really good study that was done by National Grid ESO in, in the UK and um, it's a it's a study that that has there's a, a tremendous amount of detail and I really encourage you to to have a look at it. There's a, the the link is there in in the slides, and um, but three or four major points that came out to me reading it were the the benefits of integrated offshore and onshore planning here. Whether whether it's a a, a single you know integrated offshore grid or a, a meshed offshore grid or it's just uh, generator lead ties, um, but the benefits of integrating that offshore and onshore planning and not having uh, a single planning regime for a single wind farm connected into the onshore system uh, are tremendous here. You can see just with the graphics, first of all, if uh, if you look at the current approach, which is um, connecting AC or DC, depending on the distance of the wind plant to shore, um, 
you see the number of cables, the number of landing points, uh, which, that's, which that uh, ends up with. Um, if, if you look at then an integrated approach where all of the, the planned offshore wind plants are planned together and uh, they're connected to shore with um, you know, multiple, uh, through multiple paths, uh, multiple pro mostly DC paths, um, this, this approach really minimizes the landing points. Um, one of the key things that, that really jumped out to me was if if they if they uh, started this integrated offshore approach, if integrated offshore and onshore approach by 2025, they save 18%, which ended up to be about six billion in in capex and opex. If they wait until 2030 and continue doing the status quo until 2030, that saving drops to three billion, um, according to this study. And one of the huge things from my point of view is the landing points. So the landing points are reduced by 50%. And I think that's something that we're going to start to hear a lot more about in this offshore wind conversation is the impact of reduced landing points and how, how much we can do as an industry to come up with solutions that really minimize the impact on the onshore system and minimize the amount of, of disruption that we have to our beaches and, and to our, our local communities. Um, and the, so the integrated approach also then minimizes the onshore upgrades required in this uh, in this study because you've you've uh, you've considered all of the aspects as one sort of integrated planning. Um, so what is, what is that uh, to bring that back to the U.S. context and maybe set Gary up for the for the final grid integration portion of the uh, of the presentation? You know, in the U.S. context. You want to think about what does the grid look like with really high penetrations of offshore wind? How can we use the infrastructure we've already got? Uh, how do we do we build corridors from from the shore to the the HV grid infrastructure, which isn't in most places near the shore? And um, what's the impact of the neighbouring states' targets on on my targets? And um, how do I you know we need to have some form of of higher level uh, planning and studies to to determine. Um, if we start to pump so much offshore wind in, how does that impact the, the operation and the stability of the system? Um, and the assumption that you can rely on your neighbor may not be there if they're, if they're uh, considering the same amount of offshore wind. And how do we look at coordinating synchronous plant retirements and, and offshore wind connections? So these are these are some of the questions that we're looking at at EPRI um, in, in our R&D programs. And um, these are, we're, we're really looking uh, looking at these in the future. Um, so with that, I think I'll, I'll hand over to Gary uh, to take us through to the, the final part of the, the grid integration presentation. Thanks, Gary. Great, thanks, Jonathan. So I'd like to talk about some of the grid inter, inter, integration and what are some of the challenges. And this shows four of the challenges uh, related to interconnection of renewables overall of course, offshore wind being one of those uh, resources. Looking at the left, the, the variable generation uh, profile, you know, renewable energy is weather dependent, which introduces a certain level of variability. Some people use the term um, intermittent, but I, I think variable is a more apt description of of the behavior of renewable generation. But it is difficult to forecast, particularly at a, at a local level. As you expand your forecast area, uh, you can get a little bit more uh, improvement in the predictability and ability to forecast renewable generation. Uh, but forecasting does remain one of the industry challenges. The other challenge with renewable generation is it's quote, not dispatchable. Since it is weather dependent, the weather conditions don't allow the generation uh, resource uh, to, to be able to produce power, you can't make it produce power. Uh, so, and then the final component is there's a timing issue. Uh, you know, what is the profile of the renewable generation versus what's the profile of, of the load? And Brandon touched on that a little bit when he did the analysis looking at how solar onshore wind and offshore wind uh, can be coordinated and looking at the load. Uh, he, he identified a couple of gaps, but uh, timing remains a key issue in terms of renewable generation. Another challenge is location. Uh, there is a report that was issued by ACOR 
uh, which is called the macro report, looking at transmission investment to enable renewable generation. And part of that is introducing flexibility into the grid so that renewable generation can be moved, in the case of the US, across the country based on where load is uh, and matching that to the renewable generation. NREL also did a study called the SEAMS report, which was referenced by the macro report. And the SEAMS report from NREL looked at transmission investment to enable renewable generation development, uh, pointing out that for every dollar invested in transmission infrastructure, there was a $2.50 uh, benefit, economic benefit uh, in terms of enabling renewable, uh, renewable generation. So when we look at the United States, you know, we have offshore wind, particularly on the eastern eastern coast. We have a I guess a vertical uh, range of where onshore wind is available, particularly going from Texas up through the Dakotas. And then we have a southern tier for for solar uh, that expands across the country. And the question is, is you know, typically. Uh, we don't have renewable generation at utility scale near the load centers, and that that uh, certainly challenges us. And the transmission investment uh, can can address that, as we've shown in uh, Brandon and Jonathan with the East Coast offshore wind development. One of the benefits is that the load centers are close to to the offshore wind. Inertia. I'll touch on inertia in a, a little bit later on the slides, but basically, inertia is the inverse of frequency. Grid inertia is important if there's a disruption. Uh, you want the grid to remain as stable as you can. You don't want a rapid decay in frequency if there is a grid disruption because then uh, devices or generation will trip off and that can lead to a grid collapse. So the more inertia you have, the better. What contributes to inertia is the rotating uh, equipment, the rotors basically of large uh, thermal generation, such as coal and, and, hide, uh, and nuclear. And when those units start to retire, you can see a, a, a drop in the grid inertia, which again is an element of grid stability. Also, uh, there's an issue around short circuit capability uh, that is important. And again, the thermal generation adds to the short circuit capability of the grid, which is important for prote protection and control. The modularity and distributed, that's more of a solar PV uh, issue at the, at the grid edge, uh, not as relevant for, for offshore. So, there we go. So those same drivers on this slide are shown on the left that I just mentioned. And these are the areas of grid operation that are impacted by those, those drivers and challenges. And so the focus would be for, for today would be on the system operation on the left, uh, which really addresses forecasting, wide area monitoring technologies, and also FACs, which are flexible AC transmission solutions. These are the, the static compensators, stat comms, uh, could be storage, uh, could be other technologies uh, related to, to grid operations uh, that can help support and help manage the, the operation of the grid. The other key element on this slide is the transmission uh, column. And again, when you look at offshore, we've talked already about HVDC uh, cables for interconnecting the offshore wind, as well as high voltage AC cables, and in storage, uh, and also flexible AC transmission solutions uh, can help address some of the, the issues around either constraints or the grid, uh, the grid stability uh, requirements. So just to give an example of location and location constraints, uh, if you look at the first box, which is Germany, there's a lot of offshore uh, wind generation to the north, which means there's about 120 miles of transmission, which is required to bring that power down to uh, the load centers, which are down in the southern part of Germany. Frankfurt uh, is one of the industrial areas and load centers, and Munich is also located a little bit farther to, to the south. So we do need to make sure that we have the transmission capability and capacity to move the power. In this case, in, in Germany, it's about a, it's, uh, um, 
Yeah, it's 200 kilometers, which is about 120, 20 miles. In Texas, uh, wind generation has been developed. This is onshore wind has been developed in the West. Uh, we have about uh, 400 kilometers or 240 miles to be able to bring that power to, to the load centers, which would include Dallas and Austin, San Antonio, and Houston. Those are all towards the Eastern part of the state. And there we have overhead lines, but we've also implemented fax solutions such as series capacitors to reduce the impedance and losses of the overhead lines, as well as statcoms to provide voltage support uh, and relax the transient stability limits uh, of the transmission lines uh, under, under heavy loading. I also included the, the box on the right just to show the US East Coast and you've seen the slides uh, that Brandon and Jonathan presented regarding where the offshore lease areas are. But I, I put this slide in because one of the things in terms of grid operations and coordination, along the Northeast, we have three different independent system operators and three different planning organizations associated with those. So in the green is ISO New England, uh, which operates the grid in New England. New York has its own uh, independent system operator, the New York ISO, and then moving a little bit farther south, uh, PJM is the independent system operator for the area that's shown in purple, which extends all the way down and catches the northeast corner of North Carolina. But the coordination and the planning, uh, particularly as the wind generation is developed, is going to be critical, and you have multiple players and even in addition to the independent system operators, you also have multiple utilities who are engaged as well as multiple developers. And so I, I wanted to put this in just to highlight the, the need for coordination and the need for planning because there are a number of different players uh, that need to and parties that need to be engaged in the process. So just a little bit more detail on the inertia response capability and what does this mean for the, for the grid? So conventional thermal power plants like coal and nuclear have a rotor associated with that generation, which provides inertia to, to the grid. And it allows, uh, it, it, it decreases the speed at which the frequency decays when there is a grid disruption. The challenge is with, generation resources that are connected to the grid through power electronics, you don't get that contribution to inertia, which means the grid is more susceptible to disturbances. So wind connects to the, to the grid through a back-to-back -back, uh, power conversion process. So from the generator, it's been converted from AC from the generator to DC, uh, and then inverted back again to AC, this time at 60 Hertz or, or grid frequency. Solar PV is similar, except you don't have the back-to-back, -back, you're just taking DC from the solar panels and you're inverting that to uh, 60 Hertz AC for interconnection to the grid. Now a battery operates similar to a solar PV in so much as you have a converter inverter as part of the power conversion system, which means it's bi-directional. Solar PV inverters are only one direction but batteries are, are bi-directional. With a battery, you can actually inject real power. So in that regard, it actually can help support the grid uh, during, during an event. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about the role of storage uh, in a moment. But the key takeaway on this, power electronic connected generation resources to the grid do not contribute to grid inertia which then makes the grid more susceptible to frequency decay whenever there's uh, a disruption to the grid. So it becomes an operational challenge. So some of the technologies, I just wanted to show uh, some of the technologies that uh, are incorporated into grid integration. So in the upper left-hand corner, this is actually an HVDC offshore platform. It's located in uh, Germany, in the Netherlands. Basically, this is called Dole Wind 2, which is the offshore wind farm. 900 megawatts of 
uh, wind capacity, and it's located 135 kilometers uh, off the shore or off the coast. And then there's also an underground cable which is used to connect it into, into the transmission grid. Next slide, uh, in the middle rather, the next uh, picture is just the an HVDC. This is showing the uh, internal uh, power electronics and uh, associated with the, the uh, AC to DC conversion. Uh, for uh, HVDC lines. Series capacitors, not as relevant for offshore. These are more relevant for onshore wind where you have long transmission lines and you can use the series capacitors to offset the inductance of, of um, long overhead transmission lines. Uh, the lower left is uh, statcoms. So statcoms help with uh, basically relaxing the, the trend the transient stability limit of, of lines. I have another slide that specifically addresses statcoms. And then the statcom and synchronous condenser is a hybrid solution which combines the capabilities to support voltage of the statcom and then also the capability of a synchronous condenser to inject real power into the grid to support frequency and provide short circuit capability. And then on the far right, lower right corner, storage. Um, Today in the United States, pumped hydro is the largest source of storage in the grid. Uh, over 90% of our storage capability uh, in the US is pumped hydro. The fastest growing uh, investment in storage is in uh, battery energy storage using lithium ion batteries. So, I know that Brandon and, and Jonathan talked a little bit about uh, HVDC and high voltage AC. And this shows the cost comparison, uh, comparing you know, the costs for HVDC, which is shown in red, and high voltage AC, which is shown in gray. The key, the key component of cost with high voltage DC is it has lower losses. Uh, the reason the losses are lower is a cable is a linear capacitor. And uh, as you increase the length of the cable, you increase the capacitance. And the charging current associated with that capacitance then increases if you have an AC cable. When you have a DC cable, you don't have that charging current. And that's why the losses are lower for high voltage DC cables. And there's really no distance limitation for a high voltage DC cable. AC cables, high voltage AC cables, you do have that concern over long distances that you are going to have higher losses unless you provide some type of compensation. Uh, and uh, your, the losses are really being driven in large part by that capacitance associated with the, with the cable. So you can see that you have a higher first cost with HVDC. That's the cost of the converter stations. Uh, you can see the HVAC cost uh, where you have step functions in that which are related to compensation if you do have longer longer lines or excuse me longer longer cables. Uh, there is an advantage with HVDC where you can control the power flow. It can perform the functions of a statcom, so you can control uh, the the you know the angle power factor. You can inject reactive power if need be, and it also supports. Um, Black start. But we see the deployment of both high voltage AC and high voltage DC. And you know, here we, we show both the benefits for each as well as some of the, the challenges um, that each, each technology represents. I included this. Um, uh, Jonathan talked a little bit about the offshore wind in the Northeast and showed the locations of the the Boehm lease areas. But this on the left is just showing the phase one development for uh, offshore wind off the southeast corner of, of Massachusetts. And you can see in the red using uh, AC cables, uh, you can see that there is a concern regarding congestion. Uh, if you do use DC cables uh, and route some of that power around Cape Cod, uh, you, can, you can address that. Uh, that concern in terms of the congestion, which is shown in the red line. The benefit of HVDC cables uh, is you can use two cables and you can move about 1.2 gigawatts of power. AC cables 
requires three cables and you can move about uh, 400, about 400 megawatts of power. So um, the HVDC cables, when you're looking at you know, landing points um, gives you a little bit more efficiency in terms of the number of landing points required because you can move a lot more power through two HVDC cables than you can through three AC, AC cables. And then the uh, slide on the, or the picture on the right is showing phase two for that same wind farm development, uh, adding another eight gigawatts of power. Uh, again, you can see more congestion associated with some of the AC cables. Uh, this was a study that was done, I think by, it was uh, published by the Brattle Group. It includes some other analysis by General Electric. Uh, there's many, there's been many studies looking at the congestion in Southeast Massachusetts, but type of technology you use does matter. And this points to the need for the overall system planning and coordination to make sure that the integration of this offshore wind is, is addressed and that the onshore wind can handle that without creating additional problems. Uh, I mentioned statcoms and SVCs. An SVC is just uh, using thyristor technology versus the statcoms which use voltage source converters. They basically perform the same function. And what a statcom does is it addresses, oops, sorry about that, go back. I didn't realize I advanced so many slides by mistake. So what a statcom does is it relaxes the uh, transient stability limit of the line, which means by being able to inject voltage, you can move more power down a transmission line or a cable. Uh, and then the criteria is if you lose that cable, you still need to be able to remain maintain the stable operation of the grid. And so how much power you can move down a transmission line or a cable, and then be able to still lose that line without disrupting grid operations is, is called the transient stability limit. And being able to inject reactive power to support the voltage relaxes that limit, which means you can move more power down the line. The other limits for a transmission line or a cable are thermal, which is how much current you're pushing through. And then there's a physics limit, which is the difference between the two voltages. So um, just uh, the, the STATCOM enables you to move more power. And then I just wanted to talk about the grid inertia and the changing power flows. Uh, this is the UK shown on the left. The yellow is nuclear. Uh, the red is coal. This is their, the current uh, thermal generation in the UK. And you can see by 2025, the coal is gone. So that means we're losing that thermal generation inertia, uh, which is creating concern regarding uh, grid inertia and short circuit cap capability in the UK. So a solution for that is to combine a STATCOM with a synchronous condenser. So you provide the voltage support but you also provide real power that you can inject into the grid uh, to provide that grid inertia and that short circuit capability. And that's coming from the synchronous condenser. And this is actually a system called Phoenix, which was installed uh, in the UK. And then finally, offshore wind um, <clears throat> and battery storage. This is the value stack of the use cases. So renewable shifting, uh, being able to support frequency and voltage, and also re renewable smoothing, which is really capacity firming for the batteries. It's interesting, when Massachusetts did a generation uh, solicitation for offshore wind, there were three different types of battery solutions which were proposed as part of that process. One was using Northfield Mountain, which is a one gigawatt pumped hydro facility located in Western Massachusetts, basically to provide storage for, again, shifting the, or, you know, shifting the, storing the, the, the energy or the jet power generated so that you can match the generation to load, but also being able to provide frequency and voltage support and also provide the capacity for me. The other two options were building a battery energy storage at the, at the landing point. And then there was a third proposal which uh, proposed aggregating uh, distributed battery storage uh, and being able to control that aggregated storage uh, for uh, these same use cases. <clears throat> 
And so when we summarize the different, we summarize the different issues uh, in terms of grid interconnection. One, in terms of the grid connection, we do have to manage the reactive power. We do have to manage the voltage, uh, maintain the power flow, maintain the, the protection and control. And this is really in large part a planning function, which you know enables the, the grid connection. And then on the system operations, balance generation and load, you know, make sure there's adequate resources. Uh, and then on the market integration, you know, the forecasting is important, uh, being able to forecast the generation and then, you know, support the, an active, active market. So moving to the conclusions and takeaways, I'm gonna turn it back to Fabio and Brandon to, to wrap up on the conclusions. Thanks, Gary. And uh, I thank you for, for all uh, details and, and the conversation here. I will try to go just real quick so we have uh, some time for, for Q&A. And uh, I hope uh, um, as, as a main takeaway, the attendees can, can go and understand that we do have technology options. You saw AC and DCs and, and uh, you've heard as well about grid forming. You've heard how we can contribute in minimizing or optimizing uh, point of interconnection, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we, we also have uh, today in our hands technologies that uh, hope that, that support a digital integration. Uh, and, and, and I think the, the whole will only work uh, together with planning and coordination. So, and, and that's a point where I believe we, we are supporting the industry on looking things from different perspective and really analyzing uh, if the approach that has been taken so far is really the best one. And, and Brandon, would you like to add something please before we go to, to some Q&A? Sure, Fabio, thanks. Yeah, the, the, there are a few main points and a few challenges, you know, there are a lot of um, opportunities here to collaborate and and work together around the design of the offshore power plants themselves and the transmission systems and a lot of open questions around whether those should be you know single points from each plant or should they be more coordinated and, and looking towards Europe and, and some lessons learned there they've taken more of a centralized approach to that offshore grid design uh, there. I know that, and there are some questions we'll get to here around, um, you know, ancillary services and things like that. The plants can be, can provide more services than they do now. And it may require some change in the, the thinking around the design and operation um, of those plants and, and some of the financial modeling that goes into the, the projections around those plants in order for them to be able to do that viably, to be able to, to operate more flexibly, to be able to serve the grid more flexibly. And, and definitely a lot of open questions around what is the, the best approach there to fit the needs of the power system. So um, yeah, uh, there and across all of the different organizations there, um, there's a lot of interoperability uh, considerations and potential for standardization so that these things can all fit and work together from an offshore wind, individual offshore wind plants operating with the grid, or maybe those offshore wind plants operating with one another on, uh, you know, if there is some kind of offshore grid network, it definitely requires some forward thinking. Um, you know, these wind resources will be out in that ocean for quite some time. Maybe there could be two generations of offshore wind farms in that area that could operate on a on a power grid um, that's that's out at sea. So there's a lot of questions here uh, remaining to be answered, but a lot of great opportunities to continue to drive down the cost, uh, increase reliability um, for the the end customers of offshore wind. Um, thanks a lot, Fabio, and thanks a lot, Jorgen, for hosting us today. I know we have some questions to get to. Hopefully, we have a few minutes to get to those. So I'll let you go with that. I think we have just a few. Um... Speaking of outstanding questions, it looks like we've accumulated quite a few. Um, we'll run through these in the order that uh, they've been upvoted. Uh, I'll start with the first uh, as to whether a recording will be made available. Yes, we are recording today's session. All registrants will receive a link to the uh, the recording 
Uh, so we'll send that out hopefully in the next few days. Um, I'll also add, I think uh, obviously uh, we've got more questions than we have time. Um, I'm going to work with the team to uh, log these questions and, and maybe field some of them offline just to make sure that we don't leave anybody hanging here. Uh, but from there, uh, we'll just start from the top here. Uh, we have a question uh, about uh, the prospects of green hydrogen instead of battery energy storage solutions. Uh, which of the two uh, does EPRI and Hitachi ABB power grids respectively believe hold more potential for the future of offshore wind? Well, I, I can okay. take a first step and, and hand over to, to you, Brendan, maybe. I think uh, both are very viable options. So green hydrogen is, is a most, uh, I would say, an, a new technology. It's still on early stage in many countries, but both they have a, a lot of potential. I guess the, the biggest difference between the two is that uh, green hydrogen will be dispatchable. So it's, it's a media that you can transport, whereas battery energy storage, of course, it's an static uh, storage that cannot be dispatched. And also green hydrogen will, can be used in the future, not just for storage, but also for additional power generation or even on, on mobility. Thanks, Fabio. Uh, we have a question about uh, the viability of HVDC. Is there a project size threshold at which it begins making more sense economically? Uh, or is that kind of subject to analysis of any given project? Yeah, I can take that if you want. So there's a couple of questions about HVDC there and I can, I can maybe comment across them all. Um, so in terms of a specific, specific project size or a distance, it's really site specific. It's really system specific. Um, if you're talking about project sizes, generally the, the HVDC ones tend to be bigger, but that's also because the bigger ones tend to be further offshore. Um, so, you know, if you want to talk about distance for, for HVDC, anywhere from 50 to 80 miles has been in DC. And it can be closer because, you know, a lot of the, the uh, advantages which Gary talked about for the onshore grid and the onshore system operator can turn into uh, financial advantages um, in terms of developing a DC solution instead of an AC solution. Thanks, Jonathan. We have another question here about the likelihood or viability of offshore converter stations. Uh, does the team believe these would be helpful in the US Northeast? I, I would say definitely. I mean, I understand under converter stations talking HVDC. So in, if that was the question, the answer is yes. And as Jonathan just mentioned, it, it depends. So it is not a matter of distance uh, and, and power. But also I would say point of interconnection that uh, uh, it can be directly onshore, close to, 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 to the to water. But uh, as the, the, the point of interconnections, they, they get used by the projects, uh, we can face situations where the point of interconnection will be more towards inland, meaning the distance between generation and connection to the grid gets longer, again, pointing out possibly to a DC solution. Yeah, I would reinforce what Jonathan said that we need to look at each individual uh, wind wind development on, on a case by case basis. Even though the wind may not be that far offshore from land, where it actually where the landing point is may be considerably farther away in terms of availability, in terms of siting the the landing and then connecting into the grid. And, and a cable may even go twenty miles. Uh, on land before it's able to connect into the transmission grid. So I think you need to look at, you know, what is the distance, how much energy is being moved, and then <clears throat> at the point of interconnection, what are the what are the requirements in order to maintain grid stability as you connect into into the grid? And all of those are going to drive, you know, the AC versus DC uh, solution as to what what is optimal. And of course, that's that's if you're considering. A single project as well and if you start to think a little bit more integrated across the multiple offshore wind plants the the decision becomes more complex as to what you choose and um, so there's, there's a lot of factors to take into the analysis to decide that thanks all 
we have another question uh, kind of highlighting some of the fundamental differences between uh, the European grid and the United States grid, <clears throat> particularly in the Northeast. Um, and the question asks, uh, first, whether the HVDC grid uh, could be a cost effective solution for the US, which I think we've touched upon. But there's a second question in there uh, asking whether the creation of a new ent entity for independent offshore transmission uh, is needed or, or might be helpful. Um, there, there's been, I guess there's a, a, an organization which is interested in developing offshore transmission along the Northeast coast and believe there's an economic business case for establishing offshore transmission versus using generation ties, which each developer would use to bring their power back on shore. And so this is a, an ongoing discussion. I don't know that, you know, the final answer has been determined both from a technology point of view, both can be implemented. It's just a matter of finding the most economic and also the, the best uh, solution to be able to uh, connect to the grid and be able to bring that power on shore and maintain the, the stability of the grid and manage potential congestion when you do tie into the grid. You know, the Northeast is fairly congested, you know, New Jersey, New York, Connecticut, Massachusetts, very substantial load center, uh, you know, there's not a whole lot of capacity for transmission in that area, and that's going to be one of the challenges of how to, you know, again, possibly do offshore transmission, possibly do generation ties, or more likely it, it might be a combination of the two. But the offshore transmission could potentially be an extension of, you know, the transmission at PJM, the transmission at the New York ISO, and the transmission that the that ISO New England operates. And I, I think that's still to be determined. Uh, and Brandon, maybe you have something to add there or, or Jonathan. Yeah, I think that covers also there's, you know, there's additional questions kind of down the line around that. And um, there there's something to be said about having less, uh, less points of, of um, landing for the offshore wind cables. Every single one of these projects is having um, you know, really some opposition, public opposition against wherever they're choosing to try to land their, their transmission cables. Um, I think with some offshore, you know, you could avoid some of that. And, and you brought up a point as well. Every one of those cables that lands onshore is going to need to be interconnected into some onshore transmission. And that power moved around with the existing, either existing or new onshore transmission. And that's an even another barrier, basically. Um, like you, I think you just brought up a very good point, Gary, that potentially some of that power could be moved around offshore. And then even, you know, without the, without even considering offshore wind, uh, that becomes a new transmission corridor for the whole Northeast. Um, you know, and, and if you start to interconnect all the offshore wind farms into it, maybe you can get away with many, many fewer, uh, landing areas for the, the offshore wind energy. So there's, there are a lot of, um, you know, besides the economics, there may be some good economic opportunities you brought up. Uh, besides that, there's a lot of, you know, public perception and, um, you know, public impact type of issues that could potentially be minimized with that type of, of setup. The, the distances, um, it gets into another question I just wanted to point out um, that, you know, the distances, you know, the, the distances between some of the countries in Europe that have been brought up. Uh, Belgium, Germany, even the UK, Denmark, uh, that whole kind of square or, or trapezoid or whatever shape that ends up being, it's not, the distances there are not very different than the distances between, you know, Virginia and, and Boston um, or, or Virginia and, and, and Maine, if you bring it all the way up there. So the, the distances are actually quite similar to some of those things going on in Europe, um, even though some of the, some of the actual uh, plants in Europe might be a little bit farther offshore. So uh, yeah, thanks Gary. Uh, I would just add one other consideration. When you talk about offshore transmission, which could be, you know, deemed to be in the public good, that could be operated and financed through uh, through a transmission process, just like development of any other transmission. You know, if, for example, in Texas, <clears throat> they develop transmission to enable development of, of wind energy, and there's a separation of the of the tie to the to the onshore grid 
when you put in a transmission system. And if you do that, there's a theory, build it and they will come. It enables the developers to focus on the development of the wind generation and tie into a transmission grid versus developing the wind generation plus the grid connection. So it's a different approach in terms of how, how the companies are structured in, in the business model. Thanks, Al. At this time, I, th I think we're through our time limit. Uh, so we have to wrap up the Q&A, but as I mentioned, uh, we've logged the questions and we're gonna try to respond offline because uh, we have so many good ones here today. Um, before we close, I'd like to thank Fabio, Brandon, Jonathan, and Gary for their time and insights this morning. Um, my email is at the bottom of this slide. Uh, so if you have a follow-up question that didn't make the chat log here, I'd be happy to help field those offline. Um, I'd also like to mention that the National Offshore Wind Research and Development Consortium does have two upcoming webinars on the calendar. One on March 23rd, covering research portfolios in Europe, the UK and the US, and then another on April 8th, addressing challenges and opportunities for the offshore wind supply chain regarding the investment tax credit. So thank you everyone for joining today. I think it's been a wonderful session and have a wonderful weekend all.